Hello, everybody. Um, tonight, tonight, me and Jimmy are going to, I guess, roughly, the outline was to discuss morality um, and somewhat, at least, if not solely, um, focus on the two videos that I put out, uh, basically outlining why I feel um, Christianity and a omni-god specifically would negate um, objective morality. Um, I'll, those, those videos are going to be, we'll play those in just a minute. They're only 10 minutes together, not, I mean, not separately. They're about five minutes each. Um, so we'll play those so everybody knows where we're at on the same page. And then we'll come back and jump right into this. Um, we should be on for oh, an hour, maybe a little bit longer. And um, I, Jimmy, I didn't even ask you. Um, and don't feel beholden to do this. I really apologize for not doing this on air, off air. Um, at the end, if you're still, if you've got time and you want to hang around, would you like to open this up to some other people to come in or did you have something to do afterwards? I mean, either way is perfectly fine. I just, I, I wanted to throw that out there because I told some people I would ask you. Yeah, yeah, I could be, I could be free to hang around for a little bit. Okay, great. And then we'll plan on, I'm opening the room up afterwards. I'll post that in the um, live um, comment section on my channel. So, uh, with that said, Jimmy, go ahead and kind of introduce yourself to everybody and um, let us know what you uh, believe and don't believe and what you're here to do. Awesome. Yeah. So, my name is Jimmy Stevens, and uh, I think there's there's sort of a uh, an, an alias around the internet in the G plus community of necessitarian, and, and that's sort of what I've gone under a few times. Um, I am a Christian. I'm here to uh, hopefully uh, give a good presentation and vindication of the Christian faith. And that's what I, I stated in the, the comment section on your video, Ned, that uh, uh, we, for example, we had uh, been talking just a second ago about uh, our uh, wish to be humble and, and uh, wish to be uh, correctable, someone who, who corrects their own beliefs when they're demonstrated wrong. That's a virtue that uh, my religion teaches that we're supposed to seek. This is this is something that I wish to aspire to. And so because I believe that the Christian religion is true, this is something that I wish to uh, try to demonstrate as best I can here uh, in this video. I don't know how much we'll get into it, but uh, morality seems to me as good a place as any to start. As far as the, the doctrines of Christianity that I most hone in on, um, I follow the 1689 uh, Reformed Baptist Confession. I'm a quote-unquote Calvinist. That, that's sort of a thing going on here now in the G-plus community. And so, yeah, I think that's a good uh, run-through of uh, what I'm about and what I'm here trying to accomplish conversing with you, Ned. Okay, that sounds great, man. And, I mean, I've has, I mean, I, I don't know, again, how much you've had a chance to look at some of the other stuff I've done on my channel, but I've got, oh, I don't want to say quite a bit, but definitely some experience with um, other Calvinists. And, um, you know, we definitely can, you know, get into that a little bit if, if that's where the conversation leads. And hopefully, you know, in the same way, you know, like I tell everybody, I'm sure they're tired of me beating this dead horse, but I want to be wrong. I, I really think that's the only way to, to grow. So um, with that said, I think I'll go ahead and hopefully set up the um the new or the the other video or the first video and we'll play that one and then we'll go right into the second one and then that way we I thought it might be interesting to use the internal Christianity supported by historical accounts within the Bible to explore their claims. To be clear, the argument that resulted from this exercise is in no way claiming that objective morality cannot exist, nor is it an attempt to prove that God itself does not exist. In fact, for the sake of the argument, one must be willing to not only grant the existence of a Christian like God, along with all of its attributes, but you also must be willing to grant the Bible, at least in part, is inerrant. When I did this, I was surprised to find that, outside perhaps a person immediately and without question, following orders, there is no action in and of itself that is objectively moral or immoral. 
to be clear, what I am claiming is with a Christian type God, objective morality cannot exist. Now, I understand this is a big claim. And the best way I know to demonstrate why I feel this is the case is through a thought experiment. I caution you that some of the conditions that I'm going to need to put forth are going to be horrific and will challenge most people. So I suggest that everyone get very comfortable with being uncomfortable. I would like to ask you to now imagine a woman in labor giving birth to a son. Immediately after the birth, a person approaches the baby, announcing to everyone that due to a past crime of the infant's father, this person will now infect the newborn with an illness that will cause the child to instantly become very sick and will also result in the infant's death within a week. Okay, ask yourself, was that good, bad? And if you do believe it was one or the other, was it objectively so? Now, it's understandable that some of you may believe what I've just described is purely a fictitious event invented by a depraved mind. And while I'm sure there are many who would agree with you, I caution you on being so quick to make that assertion, because I can assure you that according to the historical text contained within the Bible, this exact event took place. And in fact, it was the Christian God himself who was the person infecting and killing the newborn child. For the sake of brevity, this will be the only example that I will be using. However, as I am sure most of you are well aware, Scripture provides many examples of God acting and ordering others to act in a way that without his involvement would have been considered at least morally reprehensible. But again, due to God's participation in those activities, we must consider them to have been absolutely good and objectively moral. This leaves us realizing there's no need to condemn God's actions. In fact, we ought to do the opposite and make sure that everyone understands that every action God has ever taken had to be absolutely good. Once that's realized, objective morality can no longer be viable. Finally, objective morality may still in fact exist, but if so, that reality is only possible without a Christian type God. So theists, an apologist in particular. Take your pick. You can have objective morality, or you can have your God. But you most certainly cannot have both. All right, to save a little time, I'm going to cut it right there. This video is meant to be a companion to an earlier video I did regarding the implications of a Christian God on objective morality. For better clarity and understanding, if you haven't had a chance to view that video, I suggest you go do that now before continuing. In short, this video will focus on the question of, without divine revelation, can a person ever determine the moral state of any observed action? And attempt to demonstrate why the answer must be no. And yes, I understand I am once again out on a limb making a huge claim. Let me see if I can demonstrate why I feel so confident in doing so. Well, I ask you to envision yourself out hiking in Alaska, and when topping a rise, you notice a large group of boys who are being pursued by two bears in the valley below. It is obvious that they cannot escape, and without your interference, the bears will soon overtake and maul the boys. You have the means and ability to kill the bears before they attack them. So the question now becomes, is the moral action to kill the bears or stand by and allow the boys to be mauled. I'm sure you're aware I didn't pick this situation arbitrarily. In fact, it's based directly from the historical narrative contained within the Bible. And because of that, we know not only did 42 boys get mauled by bears, but those bears were in fact sent directly by God himself and therein lies the problem for us as the hiker. Since we don't know, nor can we know, why the bears were attacking the children, how can we ever morally determine what our reaction to this situation should be? And that brings us back to the original question, and why I must answer no. Let's see. Well, I don't think
system that creates a set of circumstances in which every moral decision leads to the human becomes indeterminable. So as much as the least may disagree, it is clear the existence of a God will not only hinder, but perhaps even be impossible for one to know and use morality. As always, thanks for watching. Um, I guess with that said, and hopefully now everybody is somewhat up to speed, at least what my beliefs are, <laughs> um, I'll let you kind of start hammering away because, I mean, that's, that's what I enjoy is let's, you know, let's, let's see where we're at. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, so the first thing that uh, popped out to me, Ned, when I was watching this is, and I'm sort of following the original comment that I made as sort of a format just to bring up questions but the, but the first question that i have is um what is meant by objective morality because it seems to me um that from the way it's portrayed in the videos the words are being used differently uh when you use it than when uh your christian opponents are so okay. it seems to me like when you when you watch the majority of uh, you know, YouTube apologetics, if I could use that phrase, people using the terms objective morality usually mean, it seems to me, moral realism. That, that is the view that um, more propositions which communicate moral facts, like X is wrong, or um, you ought to do Y, or something like that, have uh, extra mental reality as their reference. That it's, you're saying something about uh, reality that is not reducible to your opinions or your feelings or your choices or anything to do with your um, cognitive slash mental states. Right. It's it's something that would be there even if you didn't exist, right? Right, exactly. And, and I think that um, even if, and I've also heard people use it kind of in a, um, oh, an absolutist state to where no matter what, um, it's always wrong, period. Um, you know, let's say like the example I used in the first one, killing babies, killing babies without exception is always wrong, regardless of context, regardless of situation, regardless of the individual performing the act, it's just always wrong. Um, again, that's a little stretch and I don't know if how accurate that would be to quote unquote the I guess, real definition of objective. But um, I think that video kind of touches in, a, it was meant to, to kind of touch on both aspects of that. Number one, it is, it is without um, at least human, um, I guess. Exception. Yeah. I mean, it, regardless, if, if God says it's right, it's right, period. And I guess if someone wants to say, well, that's subjective because it's God's opinion. Okay. I'll, I'll, I can, I can say the, the objective part of that, I'll take it off and say that there's, but from a human perspective, it would still be objective because we don't have a say in that regardless what, how we feel about it, regardless how it would turn our stomach or not, it's still a right or wrong objectively in our sense. Secondarily, if they want to say, okay, it's always wrong to do this. Okay, then again, we can go down that road and talk about is killing babies always wrong, um, even without a God. Um, that was the main reason that I prefaced that video was saying that objective morality may exist, but when you put an omni-God there, it makes it very, very difficult to defend. Um, and I, I may have turned the gain up too much on that, so I don't want to yell over everybody. Um, but anyway, does that kind of clarify what I was trying to get at? Sure. Yeah. So there's also this this sense where uh, you're not only saying by objective morality, you not only you're not only talking about uh, moral realism, but you're also talking about uh, at least at least a qualified form of moral absolutism, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. And I guess that's where I would uh, want to ask the question, right? When when somebody says like, for example, you know, abortion is always wrong. There's a certain, there's context to which these statements come in. On on the YouTube videos, there may just be a short-sightedness of 
the person giving the video and what they're thinking they're communicating is abortion is always wrong because of God's revealed law, right? Because of God's um, moral truths that he's set before humanity to follow. And if that were the case, then the moral absolutism isn't uh, a moral absolutism without the qualification of theism. It's precisely a moral absolutism that is situated within a theistic system. On the other hand, the person could just be saying, no, abortion is wrong, regardless of whether or not uh, there is a God. The, the, the fact of God's existence is irrelevant, or at least um, uh, irrelevant to the truth of uh, whether or not it's wrong to uh, commit abortion. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, oh, so yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to point out is I don't think that the the majority of uh, the the Christians that are arguing for this so-called objective morality, I, I think that that's just more of a miscommunication on their part. I think what they really mean is theistic moral realism, not uh, moral precepts that exist or apply or are true regardless of anything else. Okay, say that again because I missed. I'm sorry, I, I missed a little bit of that. My son came in for uh, putting him to bed, so I had to give him a kiss. Sorry again. You say that I heard the first part that you said that um, most Christians would would gravitate more toward moral realism, and then I got cut off. So restate that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I what I'm trying to point out is I know for myself and many others, and I think. I don't think that I'm uh, being inaccurate to say that when Christians use the phrase objective morality, they're sort of miscommunicating or communicating poorly uh, theistic moral realism. They don't actually mean to say that there's some kind of moral precepts floating out there, which is rather platonic. What they really mean to say is that um, because of their theism or, or um as part of their theism, their their Christian faith, there are these moral precepts that God has set into the created order, and those include things like um, killing is wrong, uh, lying is wrong, so on and so forth. Right. You, you can... Right, and and actually, that that is what um, I was springboarded this this entire. Um... Oh, I guess set of videos, which I've got a couple more in the works, which who, who knows when I'm ever going to post them, if ever. <laughs> but, um, but I think that is that is actually the foundation of both of those videos in that if God mandates it, it is 100 percent correct. And regardless of any. Um, well. Definitely any emotional or um, even intellectual response that we may want to have that's converse to that order or converse to that uh, mandate from God, it doesn't matter. Because if God is the one, like you said, setting, setting the rules, then by definition, it makes it moral. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 go ahead. So yeah, I, I would I would agree exactly with that, but I guess then I I don't see where the problem follows, right? Because isn't isn't um, some things being the case uh, as an extra mental reality exactly what it means to be objective? Okay, and if if we if we go with that, then the second video becomes extremely important because the problem is is we don't have any way in this in the way um, you know. Just as I set it up. I mean, if you look at Second Kings and what happened there, um, if God do, does act um, in that way, then any action that we see from the outside, from our human perspective, we cannot draw any type of morality or let alone any, any, any utility, utility ethics from it, because there's no way to discern from our perspective um, what, what that, um, action, who brought about that action? Um, in fact, if we, 
and again, I don't know where you come where you come down on this, but if God's plan is absolute and God has literally um, written the script, if you want to kind of look at it in in that term, um, and dotted every T, I mean dev- dotted every I and crossed every T from the beginning to the end, and we are, for lack of a better term, just players in this, and we not only have a role, but our role has been laid out for us, which in a lot of ways, I think Calvinism, you know, would, would support that. Then any action, the starving, the starvation of a child, the, the, um, you know, well, I'm not getting into all the horrific acts, any hack that our depraved minds can come up with because it's part of God's plan, because it's part of God's will. It has to be a good because it's bringing about a good. God, by definition, set that in motion and contrived this entire play to happen exactly as it is playing out. There's no such thing as good or bad anymore. It's all good. Everything is good. So to come down and even attempt to, in any way, shape, or form, discern what's writing wrong, right or wrong is just a complete waste of time because there is no such thing. Right and wrong doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, so it seems to me that uh, there's two objections here. The, the one objection, or, and, and they're, they're definitely interlocked, but they seem to um, be sufficient, each one on its own. The, the one is that God sits apart from our realm. He, he's not a human being. And because he is the kind of being uh, for whom what it means to be that kind of being is that your thoughts are just true as of thinking them, right? What, what, what you say or what you believe, if you're God, when you're doing it, it's true, just, just de facto. Um, because of that, and because God is responsible for uh, the universe that we live in, uh, which facts um, our minds in relating to are fallible, there's a problem there. Uh, how are we supposed to know uh, right from wrong, good from evil? How, how do we not fall into um, an, ineffable, an, an ineffable God scenario? How do we not fall into um, uh, what's what's Plato's well, word for it. I, I think I think I get where you're going. I mean, and I mean, we can almost look at it from an agnostic Huxleyan pr- perspective, in that not so much that, as Huxley put it, you know, we can't know if God or God does or doesn't exist because of where we sit, but we take the principles that Hux- Huxley lined out and apply them to knowledge with an existent omni God, in that there's no way. For us, one, to discern if God does want right and wrong. But the second part of this, in my opinion, is the more problematic in that there is no right and wrong. Because if God has contrived everything that has happened before and and everything that will happen as part of a divine plan that will bring about his glory, i.e. goodness, then it's all good. Everything is good. The child molester is good. The genocide of everybody is good because it's part of God's will. It's got part of God's plan. Right. And that's, that seems to me to be the, the second objection. So, so the first is sort of um, uh, an incomprehensibility problem, right? That, that God would, God's uh, moral character would be incomprehensible. And, and the second problem seems to be um, that the word good or the word evil or any such uh, synonyms would be meaningless terms. They would they would be like saying square circle. Well, because I, I think it I think it goes farther than that because it's not just the word becomes incomprehensible, but there, in effect, there's no such thing. There's no there's no light and darkness anymore. Right. There's no yeah. You know, there, there's no delineation between the two because everything would be swung over to the good side of the scale. Right. So okay. So it seems to me. Um, there's a couple ways to go at this. Let, if I can sort of go at these one at a time, would would that be okay? If I, oh, yeah, please, yeah, to... please. I mean that that's the best way. And you know, if 
do you, and I, so I know when to respond and I don't want to cut you off. Um, when you make, are we going to go point by point and then me respond or do you want to do all of them and then me respond to each one individually? What, what do you like better? Uh, I'll, I'll try to give a pretty quick response to both of them. Okay. And then, uh, I'll let you respond however you wish. And then I, I guess we can decide from there. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, the, to the first one, I think it's very simple. With the incomprehensibility problem, the issue is simply that um, I think uh, prima facie, what you're describing is actually true. The the God of the Bible is, in fact, incomprehensible. If left to um, our own natural means, we would be in total darkness as to his existence and character. And I think it could be argued that without his existence and character, we would be left in total darkness uh, as to everything else as well. But I guess the point of view that I am contending, the, the, the Christian point of view, is that God has revealed himself, that he accommodates himself to the cognitive faculties of man and um, self-discloses what he is like, what his characteristics are, and the things that he desires for men to do. Uh, in the world, as far as the um, the problem of good and evil, I think that the issue is just an accidental equivocation, right? Because we can use the word good in different ways, right? There's we can speak of human good, right? It's good for me to tell the truth, or it's wrong for me to tell a lie. We can speak of good on God's part; He can do things that I cannot do, like for example, He can create the universe. I, I don't have that power, but his ability to do that is a good thing. Um, we can also talk about uh, events as being valuable, events as being meaningful. And we, can, we can use the word good in that sense, but you wouldn't say that an event like a child being born is good in the same way that a person who tells the truth is good. Those are two different uses of the word good. They, they may revolve around the same value system. They, you may have the same um, axiological framework. Like for me, uh, being a divine command theorist and believing that uh, uh, meaning and value and moral truths are all grounded in uh, God's creative activity, uh, I would I would say that uh, uh, all sorts of good have to do with relaying the characteristics that are in God, right? But I still would make the distinction among those um, relays, as it were, among those um, uh, mirrorings of God's character between what is uh, a meaningful event and what is a good uh, character of human being or, or what is virtuous of human action. Does, do either of those make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think both of them do. But I think that, I mean, again, Going, going to your first your first response and into the incomprehensibility, um, the problem with that, as far as saying it's it's through revelation, um, even if we wanted to say that is the case, we don't see that reflected in humanity. Um, I mean, we can go to extreme cases and look at you know sociopaths and that type. Um, but we don't even need to go that far. Um, we look at, you know, the current population. We're pushing 7 billion. And out of that 7 billion, roughly 1.5 billion are Christians, even if you expand it to a fairly um, liberal definition of that word. So best case scenario, we're looking at, you know, around a sixth, maybe a fifth of the population. That would mean that four-fifths either are missing out on that revelation, suppressing that revelation, um, somehow have um, done things that, no, namely, one of the, well, depending on what part of the Bible that you want to say is the most important, I mean, the only sin that Jesus ever talks about that is um, non-recoverable from is blasphemy. And, um, you know, and of course, if we don't believe in Jesus, then we're definitely um, going to hell regardless. And that's almost universal throughout Christianity. Um, I know with um, Calvinist 
it's not on you. It's preordained and through TULIP and all of that. There was the elect and the non-elect. But again, trying to be as as liberal as I possibly can and give the Christian population the greatest number I can assign to it. Um, if we just go with that, the revelation end of it doesn't seem to reflect um, reality in that we see people daily um, not only running contrary to, and again, I, I hesitate to even say that because the when we look at Old Testament, we look at New Testament, we look at what was done by Jesus, what was done by Yahweh himself or God, whoever, however you want to use that, whatever the, the proper name that you use for, for God is. That's um, appropriate. Okay. Um, if we look at the actions, they're not consistent. So in, in order to try to discern a, a set of morals, a set of ethics and laws behind these, um, we don't even see the 1.6 billion Christians being consistent with that, let alone the other, you know, five roughly billion people that are on this planet. Um, so as far as the revelation end of it, I, I would have big issues with that. Um, it would seem that, you know, that, that doesn't reflect what we see. Secondarily, on, the, on the, what you said about good marrying God's nature, um, again, if, and, uh, and again, I, I should have clarified this first because I'm not real sure that, that you are on the same line as this, but I'm assuming that you do believe everything that happens, God has known the beginning from the end, the alpha, the omega, I mean, all of it. There, there's nothing that God either did, is doing, or will do that he has not already completely understood and knew exactly how it would play out. Um, namely, because he set it in motion and it's part of his divine will and plan. If that's the case, everything that we as humans would assign a negative um, <laughs> word to, good or bad, evil, whatever, it all gets washed away because it's all of it is good if it serves God. And his plan is the ultimate expression of his nature. Would that, does that make sense or am I missing something in, the, in either of those? I, I, so first of all, let me, let me point out that I, I think your description of, of my um, view of creation and divine providence is, is accurate. Okay. Uh, your, your script analogy was, was uh, well-placed. I, I would use, uh, I use the analogy of an author and a novel, a, a director and a script, or, or what have you. They're all they're all good analogies. That's exactly the the point of view that I'm coming here with. Okay. Um. So I I think if I could respond to the second objection first, the the objection being that uh, the very concepts of good and evil fall short or fall away when we have in place uh, this omni god, the, the god of the Old Testament and the New Testament, this Yahweh character. Um, yeah, I, again, I think my response to that is just, it is true that uh, the entirety of history, the, the whole expanse of God's plan is good. And that means that the event of, say, um, I, I don't want to be explicit, let's say the Holocaust, for example, right? The, the whole series of events or, or expansive history, or however you would refer, refer to it, that that whole phenomena um, that we call the Holocaust, uh, it's good in the sense that God has put it in history to uh, accomplish his works. Namely, he has put it in history to uh, better the church and to reveal his son as the savior and king of, of the universe. At least that's my take on it. But I think it would be an equivocation fallacy to say that um, saying that the event is good means that um, 
the events inclusions of people doing bad thing or, or uh, people doing bad things people doing bad actions in that event is impossible right so for example the, the holocaust includes lots of occasions where people sinned people did evil people displeased god and uh, acted against his moral dictates so yeah, that is, I, I, I i don't i don't think i would agree there um reason being is is that like the author um if that's part of the plan it may be a necessary part of the plan and in fact what this is kind of the one of the other videos that I'm working on in this series. Um, and I was on with Eric Hovind one night and his kind of one of his favorite go to arguments is, is that, you know, if you witnessed a man stabbing a child. Would you consider that an evil? And then, you know, most people, of course, because he uses the vernacular, you know, of stabbing, most people envision someone maliciously stabbing a child when most people say yes now i'd heard it before so i you know avoided it but i didn't avoid it but called him on what i knew what he was going to say next but what he usually goes to is as well that person was a surgeon and they were creating you know they were they were cutting a, a malignant tumor out of the child and they saved the child's life because of doing that now is it evil well, we can get into the semantics of was that stabbing, but again, let's stay with the spirit of the discussion and not play those little semantic games. In the same way, let's say that because we don't know what's going on with God, the only way to bring about his plan was in part to allow or even contrive the Holocaust to take place. It was it was intentionally set in motion so as to, you know, fulfill the plan that he's doing. Now, as horrific as the Holocaust may seem to us, if the good, if good is defined by God achieving his will and plan, in the same way that we may look at someone cutting open a child as reflexively repulsive, when we find out that it is to achieve, quote unquote, a greater good, then we understand and we say, yeah, it may have hurt the child. Um, I'm sure the kid didn't like it. The recovery was awful, but it's better than the alternative. Again, if this is all part of God's plan, every one of these, quote unquote, evils, I would assume would be part of that plan, i.e. God needs them to happen or Maybe uh, need may not be the right word because God doesn't really need, but God made them happen in order to achieve his goal. Therefore, no longer good, it instantaneously becomes, or no longer evil, it instantaneously becomes good because we're not only working toward the end, that good, but we're ensuring that that good, that ultimate good takes place. Right. But I, so is it okay if I. Uh sort of reinterpret the analogy you were giving about Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah. I know it's a dirty trick. Well, again, I mean if it, you know, if it if it completely de derails us, I'll call it and we'll we'll talk about that. But again, I'm very flexible. I definitely like to go where the wind blows and if you think it's going to get us somewhere, by all means, any direction you want to take it, I'm fine with. Okay, okay. Well, it the reason I would reinterpret it is because I'm I I'm trying to get across this differentiation between the sort of um, a virtuous agent goodness versus the meaningfulness of an event goodness that I think is being uh, conflated in the objection. So if somebody asks me, you know, I'm walking out and uh, I see this child being stabbed and they ask me, you know, is, is that evil? If the context is the conversation we're having right now, what I would have to ask them is, are you asking me if the person's choosing to stab you know, taking this action to stab the child is evil, or are you asking me if God's causation of that event to take place is evil? Because the two are not the same thing. Certainly, the the uh, human being's choice to do this evil, his his act, the representation of his internal character uh, before us, right? What the Bible would call uh, the fruits 
of his spirit, it's evil. But if you're asking about the meaningfulness of that event, if you're asking if that event um, serves serves a purpose and has reconciliation in the fullness of time and uh, sits before God as something that should be the case, those those two questions seem to me to be different. I, I would I would ask that they be shown to be the same. Otherwise, I I don't think that the I think that the objection kind of sits precariously on that notion, namely that uh, somebody's doing something good, right? A, a human being's action, what we would call him virtuous for doing, or what we would call someone evil for doing, is the same thing as looking at an event in history and saying, this was a good happenstance. Because for Christi Christian theism, I would say, I don't think that's the case. I think the ethics of Christianity, assuming we're doing an internal critique here, the ethics of, of Christianity are that um, God's, God uh, has a goodness, you know, we, you, we could differentiate it by saying God has, you know, a capital G goodness that sits with him uh, in eternity. It exists regardless, notwithstanding the existence of the universe. And then when God chooses to create the universe, he accommodates himself to that universe, comes into it, and gives us a lowercase g good that reveals the uppercase g good, right? But the two cannot be uh, confused. Otherwise, uh, erroneous thinking would follow. Okay, I, I, I think I follow that. Um, I guess maybe we can take one step back because maybe this is where the problems kind of we're talking past each other a little bit, I think, because maybe the way I conceive of what God's plan is and what the way you conceive of it, they, they don't match. The way that the argument was constructed was on the premise, at least the second one, was on the premise that God's plan um, was contrived and um, all, uh, I'm trying to find, think of a better word than this, but he knew everything that was going to happen. And not only knew in a passive sense, but also knew in an active sense. And that if he didn't want something to happen, being God, being omniscient, being omni-everything, he would have just said, wait a second. Now, again, how do you, how does God make a mistake? But let's just, for the sake of this, say somehow God did. But he went, whoa, whoa, okay, that's going to play out wrong. No, I don't want that to happen. I'm changing this here. So it does play out the way that I want it to. Um, or, which I think is more reflective of what, at least the way that I've read the Bible and the way I've been taught throughout a few decades, is that it's the more reflective way of looking at God's plan would be that he set everything in motion, knowing every action that was going to take place. And because of those actions, his will was going to be done. His plan was, for lack of a better, better term, going to be successful. Is that an accurate depiction of the way you envision God's plan and God's will um, in our universe? It sounds to me accurate. I, I, I would even, uh, if I could, Ned, I would, I would even say stronger. I would say that um, from my from the perspective that I'm bringing forth, uh, but, and I'll, I'll I'll use a specific citation here. When John's prologue records that uh, yep. in, in the beginning was the Word, uh, and uh, nothing came to be without Him that came to be. What John is saying there implicitly is everything that comes to be, or anything that everything that is created is caused by God. Like it's, it's something that God has brought forth. He is, he Absolutely. didn't. Yeah. That's, that's actually interesting because that is the exact um, scripture that I go to. If someone says, I don't see where you get that or how can you interpret it that way? Cause that's dead on. So thank you, but keep going. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's accurate. So um, I, again, I think, I think the author analogy is really good. And, and okay. the strength here that I really want to get across is, um, uh, Christ and his church, Christ and, and the people that he saves is sort of the end-all, be-all of, of this entire plan. 
But that's not to say that, uh, for example, this conversation that we're having right now, that all it is is a building block to get to that uh, end. Right. But rather that the very meaning of this conversation right now, the the value that it has lies uh, in in the same value that all events have, which is they are serving this this purpose, this Christ who rules the universe and his people who are going to uh, reign in it, according to this worldview. In the same way that the the Holocaust did the same, did is, I guess, presumably working to the same ends. Yeah, I, I would say that God, uh, God uses, and this is where things get shaky because um, a non-Calvinist would use the word "use" differently here. I don't. I don't mean God reacts to an event happening or adapts to an event happening in a very useful way. I mean that God intentions, or excuse me, I mean that God intends the Holocaust without uh, without which intention it would not occur. Right. He intends the Holocaust, and he intends it specifically to uh, bring about the uh, worship and glorification of his son, which I think in the case of the Holocaust um, is shown uh, very uh, deeply in the suffering of the servants of God and in the destruction of uh, people who were not his servants. Uh, okay. And but again, we can, you know, we can debate, you know, that those two points if we wanted to later. But again, I'll sure. just grant that and, you know, that let's say that that was the case. But the meaning is, is that in short, the Holocaust was good. But yes, I, so I would agree with that. But it, again, I think what you mean when you say good is dangerous because I agree it's it's good. But what I'm saying when I say that is, uh, could be put one of two ways. It could be said, when I say the Holocaust is good, what I mean is God's choice to cause the Holocaust is good. Right. right? God's choice to intend that as an event or plan that as an event or pose that or create that as an event in history is good. Or you could phrase it as the event is meaningful before God, right? God knows this event and his knowledge of it is as a, an event that is uh, valuable to him. He values it. Right. So, so going, so going back to the first video from a subjective stance from, from us, from as humans there, you'd be hard pressed to find a human that would look at it from the human perspective and say that the Holocaust was a good where they were um, grateful or they were happy that the Holocaust took place. Whereas from God's perspective, it was a good, and even even from your perspective, even from the Calvinist perspective, at least this Calvinist, you, it was a good. So what I'm saying is, is that the objective sense of of having a delineation between action, an action is either good or bad in the eyes of God, is meaningless because every action has to be good. See, but I, I would disagree. Uh... If I could make two points there really quick. The first is, uh, in referencing the human perspective, um, there's a number of philosophers that have argued that every event in history can be explained as something that's good. I mean, for for example, you take the uh, moral determinism of the Greeks, where um, Socrates was actually arguing, or yeah. excuse me, is, is it Plato now? I can't even remember. There, there was a Greek argument at one point that um, due to man's knowledge, he is only capable of doing good. It, the problem is simply that sometimes he's ignorant of how to do it. Right. So I, I would say that it's not, it's not an issue of... Well, um, see, that, that's what I'm saying. The first video touches on the subjective nature of, of good from our perspective. Because God is viewing, let's stay with the Holocaust, God's viewing the Holocaust as a good. It is a necessary, I hate to use necessary because again, God doesn't need anything, but God contrived of that, set it in motion and made it happen for lack of a better term, because it was good. Because it was, you know, like, like you said, the Bible clearly says that God does everything with a good nature and for his good intent. Therefore, that was good. 
Now, from the human perspective, it wasn't good at all. So that hits on the first video as far as looking at subjectivity of um, morals. The moral realism at that point really becomes um, problematic. On the and then on the secondary, the second video, it puts into perspective our ability to judge or our ability to um, come to a determination on what action we should take as a reaction to the stimuli that we're seeing. Because again, okay, then let's put it this way. Going back to the Holocaust, a lot of people use the old chestnut of if you could kill Hitler as a baby, would you do it? Now, this, that second video, if you substitute the bears for, and the person on the mountain that could kill the bears to save the children, if you substitute that person and do it with a Hitler analogy, if God is using the Holocaust, and again, I know that word, but it is has contrived the Holocaust to his ends, then shooting Hitler and stopping it has to be evil, has to be bad, because you're working in direct opposition to what God wants and needs. Now, I don't, I mean, we can discuss if anybody could even do it, because you are acting contrary to God, which I would assume you couldn't do. But the point is, is we don't know what we should do at that point. Because if the Holocaust happens, God's plan work, works and goes the way that God intended. If someone stops it, that runs contrary to God. Now, everything that I understand about the Bible is good is reflecting God's nature and God's will. If the Holocaust is part of God's nature slash God's will, stopping it by definition becomes evil. Right, but I guess it depends on what you mean by God's will, right? And and this is the well, I, fulfill, fulfillment of God's plan. I would say would be God's will. At least that's how I would look at it. And again, correct me if I'm if I'm putting words in your mouth or or coloring you in a way that's not reflective of what you feel. So so for Calvinist theology, what I would say in terms of ethics is, um, or Reform theology in general, actually, um, there's generally a differentiation made between the decorative will of God and the prescriptive will of God. The, the decorative will of God being, uh, actually, I'm not sure which, which one is uh, traditionally spaced, but what I would say is there's the moral will of God, which is his uh, coming down and revealing uh, commands to human beings and uh, actually imposing uh, those revelations as a part of what it means to be human, right? What, what we would call, or what we could call at least, uh, moral intuitions. And then um, there is God's historic will, which is uh, the will by which he brings about and ordains things to pass. What seems to be the issue here is when I call the Holocaust good, what I'm affirming is that God that in terms of agency, God's causation of an event or God's ordination of an event is good, but right. not that the, um, uh, what, what's, uh, uh, there's a word for the uh, things that are inside of a, a container that's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't find it. Uh, what is in the event is not necessarily what I'm calling good, right? Like if I say right, uh, and, the Holocaust and, is good, what, what I'm affirming is that God's uh, part in the Holocaust existence is good. But what I'm not affirming is that, say, um, you know, the persecution of the Jews by X, Y, Z persons was good. Certainly I would affirm that what they chose to do is evil, but okay, there's a difference between... Yeah. That, okay, let, let, let's let's go to that because I think that's important. And, and, and again, I hate cutting you off, but I, I think that was something that was pretty important there. Um, what it seems like is what you're saying is, is that one's ability to choose and let's say persecuting the Jews, like you said, the people, Hitler specifically, you know, all whoever you want to pick out of that group of wonderful individuals um, chose to do something contrary to um, what God 
would consider to be a good. Uh, it is it, in a nutshell. Does that that sound like I'm on the right track so far? Oh yeah, I, I would only strengthen okay. it by saying that they were they were uh, going against what God had revealed as a command. Okay. All right. Yeah. That that's great. Okay. So now the question for me then becomes: Did God know when He set them in motion, when he created them, when he um, contrived of this plan, did he know, as scripture would seem to indicate, that they that he knew they were going to do that? Certain, certainly, yeah. Okay. I, I think that he intended did, them to do that. that. Okay, so again, if he intended them to do that, if he, like Pharaoh, if he not only made Pharaoh, but even went so far as to actively go in and, and I don't want, again, I don't want to get into too much of the kind of picking apart scripture, but if he actively went in and hardened Pharaoh's heart and, and made him act in a way that may have been contrary to how Pharaoh would have acted if God hadn't gone in and hardened his heart, then if he did the same type of thing, or even if he built the um, Nazi party, Hitler, and all of the SS and everything else in a way that ensured that they were going to bring about um, the Holocaust. To me, in the same way, if I build a robot that has, let's say, free will, but also has this subroutine that causes it to go in kill a hundred people, kill one person. I would think that me being the programmer, me being the person who contrived, made that, and especially if I definitively knew that it would carry out that order and would kill that person or those hundred people or whatever, I would be ultimately responsible for that action. So what I'm what I'm kind of getting where my misunderstanding is, is that if God did the same thing except through the creation of human beings, why their bad actions are not associated with God? Because we know if it's associated with God, those actions are good. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would say that it's because the only way to associate those actions, right, is we would have to assume that for me to. Uh, Oh, there's just a couple issues that I'm assuming here, but I'm, I'll jump over them real quick. Um, it seems that we'd have to assume that in the same way for me to force on someone else, you know, like if I, if I put a program, uh, if I programmed a, uh, a piece of technology in someone's brain that forced them to do evils, right? We would hold me accountable for those evils, not the person. Um, or if I created a robot um, that, uh, had free will and, and had the subroutine that, that kills people, right? Whether or not you hold the robot accountable, you would certainly hold me accountable. The, the issue is you would have to assume that God is accountable for uh, what I do in the same way that I am accountable for what I do. right? Okay. And, and that would simply, according to the Christian theology that I'm uh, espousing here, trying to trying to clarify here, that simply doesn't follow. Oh, there's a, so there's that, a that's basic. Where, that's where my misunderstanding is. So, um, if you can tease out the difference between, or just what you said, why, although God, and again, if I'm if I'm poisoning a well, so to speak, by by misrepresenting this, let me know. But if God is has created everything, us included, to carry out a plan, to, in short, run a program, if you will, um, and knows because of the way he created us and because the way that he um, set about the plan, all of, all of creation, that these things are going to happen. He knows they're going to happen. And again, not knows in a passive sense, but in an active sense, he, he contrived and made sure and, and, and ensured they happened. Um, how, how is he not ultimately responsible? Because it seems, you know, when you say that the responsibility 
is somehow split at the human level, I don't understand how God can have ultimate control but not be ultimate responsible. Yeah, let me see if I can if I can summarize the issue here, Ned. So just just interrupt me and correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me the issue is I'm we as human beings intuitively, and I think that this is a biblical uh, belief. We as human beings would hold um, another human being responsible if they cause evil even from another immediate source right but what we're saying here with god is god causes the existence of evil in some sense and yet he's not held responsible for it he's he's not well no no see and again i think that's that's the thing is i'm not trying to place blame or responsibility what i'm saying is is there's no blame or responsibility to, to be placed because all of it is part of god's plan but when we start to <sighs> try to somehow take the actions of man and separate them from God's plan, now that makes sense. If we can do that, if we can tease out and say, man can act independent of God's will, okay, now I can understand how man would be responsible for his actions. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches is God is Alpha Omega. I mean, he knows everything. And more importantly, has contrived this in a way to make sure everything follows. I mean, it's dominoes. Every domino falls exactly when it's supposed to. So it's not so much that I'm trying to say that God is responsible. What I'm saying is, is I think that that becomes almost a, a non sequitur, or a, not a non sequitur, but a nonsensical question in that there's no, there's no blame to be placed. I mean, would you blame the surgeon for cutting open the child? No, because it's a means to an end. Would you blame a human, i.e. a tool of God, for bringing about God's plan? No, regardless of what that role is, regardless if you're the worst Nazi that's ever lived and you killed you know, thousands of people in the most horrific way, if you're a tool of God and that brings about God's plan, you are a good. You were made to by God, for God, with the intent of doing what you did. So, whereas I think he's responsible, I'm not looking at it as an irresponsible in a negative sense. I'm trying to, um, I guess, shed light on the fact that being responsible means there's no evil. You cannot assign an evil to a human being if that, well, again, that may be the question. Can you assign evil to a human being if that act, if that human is acting as a direct result of God's will? Uh, I would I would say it depends on what you mean by God's will, right? Because my my perspective is that um, there there is not a one dimensional explanation. For any given event. So, for example, th th my act to talk to you right now, there's many reasons I could give you explaining or, or causes I could give you explaining um, why I I'm speaking here. Okay. The, the ultimate explanation that I could give you is, well, because God predestined it. Okay. But, but I would say that God's predestination includes all of the explanations um, that I could give you besides God's God's predestiny. That is right. And and would you also agree that that God built you, God made you in a way that He knew that this conversation would take place between us, and you would say the things you're going to say tonight. I, being an atheist, yes. made as an a. I mean, all of this is part of God's plan. Right. Right. And I, I think that the 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 programmer analogy is accurate. Right. Right. I think I think that every every act that a person has ever done take take any human in history okay. it has been set in it is either set into them at birth to do that at some point right um, okay so but that that's perfect so if we look at I mean I don't I don't want to get graphic but let's just say whatever the most horrific action that you can imagine or not imagine but actually took place Anytime, let's say the Holocaust, by a certain individual, we quote unquote know that happened. That's what I'm saying is that 
if we know, like you said, God has done this, then that's part of God's will. That's part of God's plan. He made this happen. How could that therefore be an evil? Because I think, again, it depends on, <clears throat> excuse me, depends on what we mean when we refer to that as being good or evil. If, if by that we mean the event as caused by God, then sure, then I would say all events are good. But if we're talking about well, wait, wait, uh, wait. the person's choice. Well, wait, right, wait, we're talking wait, about, wait, wait one second. Aren't all actions caused by God? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, I think that trying to trying to differentiate there becomes meaningless because regardless if the the action, let's say, is a lightning strike that kills an individual, what even insurance companies would would at least in the past claim as an act of God, or a person walks up to a to an individual with a you know electrical cord and electrocutes them. Those are both acts of God. Those are both wills of God. There's nothing that happens that is outside God's plan and will, including the horrific things. Therefore, everything is good. Uh, but again, I think the, the issue is that there's uh, an accidental equivocation or an accidental deepity being there. I, again, I, I wholeheartedly agree. <coughs> Excuse me. I wholeheartedly agree that uh, the, the event is good in the sense that God knows it as a meaningful thing. He values this and he intends it and his causation and intention of this thing is something to be uh, attributed goodness. But if you're asking me about uh, what's included in the event, like for example, my, my choice to lie or, or um, somebody's choice to kill some Jews or, or something like that, those actions I would not consider good, right? And we would certainly not want to conflate. Well, the, and, and I agree. I agree from the human perspective, they're not good. But in the ultimate sense, if, there, if it is an objective, if, there is, if we have to assign an objective um, label to it, everything becomes good. There's no such thing as evil anymore. Well, but that's what I'm trying to point out is what is... Why is there, uh, how to word this, to, to, to make the argument that's being uh, presented, the, the objection that's being presented, namely that if God um, is, is the paradigm of good and uh, you know, human good is that which uh, mirrors or reflects this goodness of God and the whole of history does just that, then everything is good in that way. Um, not in that way in every way I I, I think that's where we're having the the, at least that's where I'm pushing back is that in every way things are good and and, I mean and again if you can give me an example of something that did not reflect God's will something that happened that God did not um, contrive and mandate happen okay but again I don't think you can get there at least not from the, especially a Calvinist perspective. But, but what I'm trying to point out here is that, that that dilemma resides on this false assumption that goodness is univocal when applied to events as when it's applied to human action, right? And that's what I'm pointing out is, well, that's not the biblical perspective. The biblical perspective is all events are good in the sense that God values them, that they are planned there by God. But not all events are good in the sense that they follow God's revealed law, right? 